We're here to present the findings of the Asia Foundation's new publication on the state of violence and conflict in Asia. Um, over the past 60 years, the Asia Foundation has worked in 18 countries through offices in the region, uh, supporting programs that advance governance, economic prosperity, and peace. Many of these countries have experienced some level of conflict, particularly subnational conflict, for much of that time. And as we all know, conflicts have a serious impact on our other priorities. Our conflict programs support efforts of key local actors, government, and conflict-affected um, areas to address problems that perpetuate conflict and violence. You'll hear more about this later. We hope that this publication will be a resource for those working in the field, the donor community, policymakers, and uh, give us a better understanding of the many forms of conflict in Asia. I'm happy to introduce Ellen Lapson, who will serve as our moderator today. Um, she is our, uh, the Asia Foundation's trustee emeritus, as well as former president of the Stimson Center, and now with uh, director of the International Security Program at the Shah School of Policy and Government, <clears throat> excuse me, at George Mason University. Uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, we look forward to participating in the discussion. Uh, thanks, Nancy, and, and good morning to everyone. Uh, is the, can you hear fine? Um, so one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the Asia Foundation is this very um, productive mix of both micro field experiences of understanding uh, at the community level, at the regional and national level, uh, what works and what doesn't in promoting good governance, uh, economic development, and opportun fairness and justice. And uh, the Asia Foundation has always taken a very holistic approach to development, not looking at it as a purely economic phenomenon, but also uh, as it relates to governance. And therefore, their work has often been in countries that have struggled through conflict periods, through civil wars, through uh, enduring ethnic conflicts, et cetera. Um, but in addition to that, on the ground programmatic experience, um, TAF has always been very wise in stepping back and thinking longer term about the work that they're doing. And the fact that they've been in countries for 50, even 60 years in some places, means that there's a lot of cumulative knowledge in the institution and a desire to always have a cohort of people who really are researchers and analysts as part of a team that can draw on that uh, country-specific programmatic experience. And I think it very much increases the Asia Foundation's value to governments, uh, both governments in the region and governments uh, who are aid donors, because they are not just implementing partners, they're also thought leaders of how to plan and think about economic and uh, governance uh, development challenges over time. And I think this volume is just one example of the, the contribution that the Asia Foundation makes by combining both this uh, bottom-up field experience and the capacity to look comparatively and uh, analytically across the region. Um, I'm delighted that our panel today is Patty Barron, who directs the, uh, the Asia Foundation's conflict and development work based in Bangkok. He has a PhD from Oxford, has written a book that won an award for uh, development studies, um, worked at the World Bank, uh, worked on Indonesia, and I think brings um, very deep um, and diverse experience to uh, his, his management of this of this enterprise, this is only one of many things he does, uh, but this project was under his direction. And uh, Sana Jaffrey is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago, works on comparative democratization and political violence, particularly in Southeast Asia. But her work today will be looking at regime types. What insights do we gain from different choices that societies make about governance and how that becomes both a predictor or an explainer of patterns of, of violence and, and conflict. So um, I hope you'll find this very enriching, stimulating. Uh, there's a lot of materials of how to find the, the big volume and uh, online. But I, I was just going to suggest that everybody make sure you have, I think the briefings will be a little bit easier if you have this graphic in particular, and there's some extra copies here in the front, um, just as uh, Patty and uh, Sana go through their presentations. So what we've got is uh, roughly two 15 to 20 minute presentations, and then we'll uh, turn to you for questions and comments. So Patty, welcome, and congratulations on finishing this important report. Thank you, Ellen, and uh, good morning, everyone. How do I work the 
Well, it's a pleasure to present to you on the launch of our, our new book, The State of Conflict and Violence in, in Asia. Uh, this is the first time this has been presented. You are the, uh, the guinea pig audience, uh, but I hope, you, I hope you find it useful. The report was formally launched today and can be found on our website, um, www.theasiafoundation.org slash state of conflict. Nancy and Ellen have already given a little bit of background about the Asia Foundation, about who we are and what we do. I just wanted to say up front that this volume is very much grounded in the experience of our country programs that, as Ellen have said, in many countries have been in place for six decades um, across Asia. The Asia Foundation has 18 different country offices covering most of South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, Northeast Asia as well. And this volume brings together I think both the analytic capacity that the Asia Foundation has, but the locally grounded experience of working in these countries for many years. We strongly believe that where you bring together practical experience with deep analytic thinking, you can contribute both in terms of giving policy advice, but in terms of designing better programs on the ground. And as, as Ellen mentioned before, our analytic work is not just confined to, the, confined to this report, we do many country-specific studies, but also regional studies on countering violent extremism, on subnational conflict, and, and so on. And I do encourage you to check out our website um, to take a look. I'm going to start today by mentioning briefly, excuse me, five, five reasons why we decided to produce this book. The first was we felt there was a real gap in the market in terms of producing accessible knowledge for people. Of course, there are many country studies out there. There are many thematic studies, uh, both in, in academia and also in the policy world as well. But one thing, whenever I took on this regional job that became clear was, it was very difficult to get short analyses that would get you quickly up to speed on some of the key political and conflict dynamics in a country. And so what we've done in this volume is to produce 14 different country chapters each of which are 10 to 15 pages long, they shouldn't take you more than maybe 20 minutes to read, that try and give you some of the most up-to-date data, but also historical data on what is going on in the country. I, myself, have used these whenever I've been getting on a plane to a country that I really don't know very much about. Now, of course, it doesn't substitute for long, in-depth country experience, but I think the way in which our industry works, we need to have basic knowledge of what's going on in different countries. And so I hope this will be useful um, for, for other people as well. As I said, we cover 14 countries. Um, for each, we try and give a very accessible summary information. So as you uh, peruse the book, you'll find we have a basic timeline. We have a basic overview of what we think are some of the key conflict events and some of the key conflict dynamics. And we also rate each country by the levels and forms of violence uh, across different violence types. The second uh, thing I think we bring with this, which is rather unusual, is that we don't focus on only one form of violence. There is a vast literature out there of pieces on whether countries are susceptible to civil war, intercommunal violence, urban crime, and so on. And yet very rarely do analyses bring together these different forms of violence. And I think that's important for two reasons. One is if you look at Asia, and indeed many countries across the world, Many of the people who actually die from conflict or violence, uh, those deaths are a result of smaller scale localized violence, which may kill one or two people per incident, but that cumulatively can have very large effects. And yet often the, the focus is only on conflict whenever it gets to large scale escalated levels. We also find as well, and I think this is something when you read the volume will hopefully become apparent, is that there are often interconnections between these different forms of violence that the nature of national level political contestation shapes subnational and local conflict dynamics as well. And if we only look at particular forms of violence, that picture is obscured. As I said before, in the volume we rank each country for eight different forms of violence. Now I should say up front that we actually cover nine forms of violence, but we have not ranked countries for gender-based violence um, for reasons that I will get to later in the presentation. So this, for example, is, is Bangladesh. You can see 
um, that we are ranking based on the last 15 years uh, within the country and uh, comparatively across Asia, whether countries are, are ranking uh, red uh, being high, yellow being medium, low being green. And uh, th this relates to the sheet that you have in front of you. The third objective was to be data-driven but also historical. What the, the volume does is it's based primarily on secondary source information we comb through all the literature, the policy literature, the academic literature, the gray literature, literature that, that the Asia Foundation has produced to try and get statistics on various forms of violence. But one thing that became clear when producing the volume is that if we only look at what is happening now, we miss a big part of the picture. That it is necessary to look at historical dynamics as well. And there's two reasons for this. The first is looking historically can help us interpret the seriousness of events today. This is one graph that's uh, produced in the uh, Afghanistan chapter. Um, now, one of the points the Afghanistan chapter makes is since 2001, about 100,000 people have been killed uh, in Afghanistan. And yet, if you look further back to the late 1970s, you find that while that is horrific, the death toll over the last decade or so, or 15 years or so, that if you actually look to the 1980s, levels of violence were much higher. And in fact, over one million people were killed through the 1980s in Afghanistan. So if we only respond to the events we see on the ground at the moment and do not have that larger historical perspective, it makes it harder interpret what, to interpret what we see. The second thing is, when you try to understand the violence that occurs today, it becomes abundantly clear, if you look with an historical lens, that it is often historical events that have shaped the cleavages through which violence plays out in, in contemporary times. You look, for example, um, at the partition of East Pakistan and West Pakistan with the formation of Bangladesh. Those same political cleavages are the ones that cause turmoil today. And yet, if you only look at current historical events without bringing in that, that aspect, um, you miss something. Likewise, if you look at the subnational conflicts which have affected half of the countries and South Asia and Southeast Asia over the last 20 years or so, it's often historical, perceived in historical injustices related to the ways in which subnational territories were incorporated into national states, which play out in the narratives that are utilized for mobilizing people for violence today. So what we try and do is we are data-driven, but we also use this historical lens. And indeed, the book focuses on longer-term issues rather than just current incidents to which I think, unfortunately, the policy audience often pays uh, a little bit too much attention. The fourth objective was to be comparative. Again, looking at one country, it's easy to see things as being particularly bad. But when you step back and you compare with other countries, you can start to see, it helps you interpret the situation in the country you're interested in. As Ellen mentioned before, a lot of my doctoral work and, and past experience was in Indonesia. And yet, if you compare Indonesia today with many other countries in the region, it's actually doing a lot better than many places. And so having this comparative analysis can help us understand um, conflict or violence in, in a, a particular country. Um, you have this sheet in front of you. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna use this at various points, but not talk through the details. Um, but what we did is we ranked each country um, by the level of violence for each form. Um, and what you can see is it allows you to start to interpret how a specific country ranks next to many, many others. The volume also includes five different thematic essays, one of which Sana is, is an author. We focus on um, five issues we thought were particularly important. The first is land and natural resource conflict. The second, which Sana will speak on, is on regime type and conflict. We look at anti-minority violence, uh, we look at gender-based violence, and we look at the impact of cross-border flows on insurgency and terrorism. And hopefully you will have a chance to read them, and I, I think they're very useful as well in trying to bring out some of the broader theoretical and, and policy points that emerge from, from the country chapters. I'm now going to talk briefly about five emerging patterns um, that, that came, out, came out of the analysis. These are contained in the introduction, which we have uh, printouts for as well. The first is that conflict and violence affect every country in Asia, not just those thought of as conflict-ridden. I've worked as a conflict advisor for many years, and it's very easy to start to think in binary terms. This country or this region is conflict-affected. This place is not. 
And yet, actually, when you start to explore what is going on within countries, you find that almost every country has high levels of at least one form of violence. Um, the UN and the World Bank have just put out a, uh, a flagship paper on prevention. And I think this is on conflict prevention. This is really important because, again, the development industry um, and those who work on foreign policy tend to only look at whenever the large-scale violence has already occurred. And yet, if you look more comprehensively, you see patterns of violence in many rather places that are ostensibly peaceful that have the potential for escalation in the future. Again, if we look at this chart as well, we find the only two countries in our analysis where we did not find a red, a high level of one form of violence, were Indonesia and Malaysia. Now, as I'll get to later on, I think Malaysia, there are potential risk factors there that we need to pay attention to. And for Indonesia, and in fact, we had quite a bit of debate within my team on this, there are certain forms of violence that you could arguably um, say, say are high as well. So across these 14 countries, some of which are fairly developed, some less so, uh, we find high levels of at least one form of violence. The second point to emerge was that success at managing national conflict in Asia has largely been at the expense of subnational and local violence. Since the end of Nepal's civil war and the end of the, the civil war in Sri Lanka, no country apart from Afghanistan has had national level civil war. You don't see countries in Asia where the state is completely collapsed, where there is no control over, over the regions. And yet the very means through which national stability has been achieved have created tensions and incentives that have led to frequent subnational and local level violence. Uh, I think there's a couple, of, uh, a couple of things going on here. One is the way in which national elites have shared the pie um, has essentially created systems, patron-client relations that have created grievances and injustice at the local level. You see this very much with, for example, land and natural resource conflict, where essentially elites have had common interests at the national level, have passed policies or pursued strategies that have benefited their interests, and yet those have been seen as unjust at the local level, in particular for people displaced from their land. You also see this with subnational um, conflicts, uh, separatist conflicts, conflicts demanding more autonomy, where the, way, the, the very strategies that national elites, national state-based elites have pursued have created regional inequalities, uh, which have led to um, uprisings and, and violence. The third pattern is that politicization of ethnicity and religion creates future risks. I think this is something we see in, in many Asian countries um, at the moment. This graph here uh, is from the Ind Indonesia chapter of the volume, and it shows data on identity-based conflicts uh, over the last 10 years or so in, in Indonesia. The red line is deaths from identity conflicts. It stayed fairly steady, but the number of incidents has been on the rise. And we know from past historical experience that that creates vulnerability for escalation into larger scale violence. I think this is very much a product uh, in part of um, national leaders, of political leaders, trying to play the ethnic or religious card in order to carry favor, to gain votes, and, and, and so on. And this is something that I think you see in many other countries, such as uh, India as well. I wanted to speak very briefly about Malaysia as well, somewhere that people do not think of being as, as conflict prone uh, um, at all. In Malaysia, politics has been deeply shaped by ethnic and religious dynamics since the uh, independence from the Brits. The government has supported a new economic policy which has given preferential access to Malays at the expense of Indians and Chinese. And in general, this, is, um, this has held things together. I think in large part because it's been accompanied by high levels of economic growth so that everyone benefits. And yet I don't think in the Malaysian case that we should um, be too confident that this may not give rise to problems in the future. Again, if you look historically, you see a series of intercommunal riots. In 1969, for example, there were almost 200 people killed, largely Chinese, in, in communal riots there. Um, and I think in, in, in Malaysia as well, you've seen growing use of the Islam card as a way to try and uh, gain votes, both from the, um, the government and also from, from the opposition as well. A fourth pattern um, is, I think, development and urbanization in Asia will likely lead to more rather than less violence. 
Now, the academic literature shows that rich countries tend to do better than poor countries in terms of managing violence. If you look, for example, at the top 20 countries in the Global Peace Index, they all have a GDP of over $30,000 PPP. And I think, you know, cross-nationally, there is evidence that once countries get to a certain level of development, they tend to be less prone to violence, although that's not always the case. In particular, if you look at homicide rates in some cities in the US, that shows that that's, that's not always true. And yet, the processes, the development and growth processes by which countries become rich are conflict producing. And I think this is particularly worrying for Asia. You see East Asia and South Asia have had higher levels of sustained growth over the past decade than any, any other region in the world. You see high levels of poverty reduction. And yet those very same processes have created tensions and contestation that without having institutions that can manage them lead to problems. I want to focus very briefly on three different forms of violence that I think you see emerge. The first is violence related to urbanization. If you look at the two most, um, the two cities in which you have the highest likelihood of being killed in Asia, two capital cities, um, you won't guess. They're Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia and Dili in Timor-Leste. Both Ulaanbaatar and Dili have higher homicide rates than Kabul. Now, of course, they're smaller cities, so fewer people are killed, but using the standard measure of violence intensity, 100 deaths per 100,000 people, you find that actually your likelihood of dying in a violent incident is higher there. Now, it's no coincidence that those are amongst the cities in Asia that have seen the highest levels of urbanization. Over the last, um, over the last 10 years, uh, almost, uh, in fact, over 2 million Asians have left the country for the city. That is a rate of urbanization that is five times what Europe experienced. And this urbanization on steroids has created tensions in the places they move to. In Ulaanbaatar, over half of the population live in unplanned, sprawling cities, often with lack of services, conditions which give, uh, um, give rise to high levels of crime. In Delhi, you find a lot of young men with not a lot to do, without jobs, who are easily mobilized for crime, or indeed sometimes in political violence. And if you look at the 2006 incident, where there was a split within the military where both sides mobilized young youth gangs who often were participating in martial art gangs in a crisis that displaced 150,000 people. So wherever you do not have the institutions to manage the tensions that come with urbanization, I think there are, there are risks of, of violence. The second thing I, I wanted to mention um, was land acquisition. Again, something that is really important for growth Growth requires large-scale infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. It requires investment, both foreign and local. And yet, if you look at countries like India and, and Cambodia, you see a coexistence of the government trying to push through uh, land acquisition for large-scale infrastructure and rising tensions. Um, the Naxalite Rebellion in India stretches back to 1967. Uh, it now covers 20 out of 29 states within in India. Um, and this was a movement, a local movement to pro um, protect indigenous land rights. If you look elsewhere in the country as well, you see a rise in land conflicts associated uh, in particular since the passing of the Land Acquisition Act of 2013, which removed clauses on consent and social impact assessment. It made it easier for the government to um, build large-scale infrastructure. Now, this is not to say that building large-scale infrastructure is bad, but again, where you do not have mechanisms in place for redress, for managing tensions, you can have problems. And indeed, um, recent data uh, collects at least, um, finds at least 252 large-scale land conflicts ongoing in India. In Cambodia, they have a scheme called the Economic Land Concession, whereby the state leases public land to large investors, which is all good, except for the fact that you have large numbers of people who live on those land who are then displaced from those land. 16% uh, of the country is now an economic land concession, and you can just imagine the number of people affected. And indeed, one uh, human rights organization, uh, Likado in, in uh, Phnom Penh, um, has data that over half a million people in Cambodia are currently affected by, by land conflicts. And the third one I wanted to mention again was subnational conflicts. The Asia Foundation has done uh, flagship research on subnational conflicts in, in Asia. 
looking at um, separatist movements or movements demanding more autonomy. And what you find historically, again, is a fairly tight correlation between the number of subnational conflicts and the levels of economic growth in the country. That these conflicts tend to be uh, just as likely to occur in middle income states than in, in low income states. Um, and this, I think, um, is in part a product of growth exacerbating and aggravating historical regional inequalities. That the processes um, through which growth occur create inequalities, both at the individual level but at the regional level. And in the absence of effective responses from the government, this can lead to more grievances. And I think it's the case of uh, Say Marawi in, in Mindanao in the Philippines shows that this is a worry not only because of these subnational conflicts, but because it also creates fertile um, uh, land for, for terror recruitment as well. The final emerging pattern I wanted to mention was about gender-based violence. Um, it, as I said, we do not classify countries by their level of gender-based violence because we just don't think there is solid enough data there to be able to compare from, from country to country. But this slide here um, just gives you some uh, data points from, from different countries. And one thing that became clear in almost all of the countries we worked, at, worked on is the horrific level of gender-based violence going on in the country. In India, for example, according to government data, between 2011 and 2015, you had four, over 4,000 diary-related deaths. These are deaths where people were killed for not paying a diary or where women or their families are committing suicide because, uh, because they could not do so. In Pakistan, we have, again, using government data, over 50,000 recorded cases of violence against women. Uh, in Timor-Leste, uh, a survey the Asia Foundation uh, did last year found that almost two-thirds of women reported violence um, at home. Um, and in Nepal, there, where there's been rising political tensions in the last year as there's been the first local elections in, in two decades, despite this and despite electoral-related violence, um, data still shows that gender-based violence kills more than any other form of violence in, in Nepal in the past year. So this is worrying, and yet we know that this is under-reported. Under because, of course, most domestic, based, uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence occurs within the domestic sphere. And, and that there are incentives and cultural barriers towards, towards people uh, reporting that. Indeed, in India, mo far more people are killed from gender-based violence than have been killed by the Naxalite Rebellion or by any of the rebellions in the northeast of the country. Okay, just to conclude, I want to um, briefly run through five critical implications um, for policymakers and those who actually want to uh, um, build peace in Asia. The first point is the need to target conflict hotspots but remain alert to risks elsewhere. There are, of course, many places of escalated conflict throughout Asia. Afghanistan, subnational conflict zones in Myanmar, the Philippines, and Thailand, border areas of Pakistan, uh, and so on. But what the volume shows is the high levels of violence that occur in many other countries. Places that we don't think of as being particularly violence affected, like Timor, like Mongolia, show high levels of, of violence. Also, in many countries that seem to be doing well at the moment, relatively well, Sri Lanka and Nepal, both post-conflict countries, again, a historical analysis shows that we should not take for granted that peace is going to last. And then in, in countries like Cambodia and Malaysia, the volume identifies clear conflict risks that may not turn into violence, but certainly there is potential to do so. And so I think it's very important that we don't focus only on the places that we think of as having high levels of violence, but in the wider um, range of countries in the region. The second point I want to make again is the importance of understanding history and the politics. This history is what has created the incentives of political leaders today. And it is political leaders today who have the ability or the incentives to push towards peace or to allow violence to occur. The roots of current contention often lie in history. The partitions in South Asia, the choices made by post-colonial elites, have led to the cleavages that drive violence and contention today. We need to understand the history and the politics. The third is to focus on building the rule of law. By this, I don't just mean 
rule of law narrowly defined in terms of the formal judicial systems. I mean the broader array of institutions, formal and informal, that govern power within a country. Many, peace building is important. Working to support peace processes is important. Working on security sector reform, on local conflict mediation, these are important things. But reading through the country chapters, I hope it becomes clear to you that many of the problems lie in the broader way in which power is divided and governed within a country. And so this requires working on strengthening um, the channels for resolving grievances, for resolving contestation within countries, for working on elite impunity that generates grievances. Peace building cannot be separated from the broader development enterprise. The fourth point is the need to deal with cross-border drivers and to promote country learning. One of the chapters in, in the volume uh, by Anthony Davis, a security analyst based in Bangkok, looks at the extent to which um, cross-border flows of people, of money, of guns, drive and sustain violence in many areas. There are obviously many theaters where this is particularly prominent. The Afghanistan-Pakistan border, the Pakistan-India border with Kashmir, Northeast India and its links into Bangladesh or Myanmar, the Thailand-Malaysia border, and the Philippines-Malaysia-Indonesia triangle. In all of these places, you see these flows of people, guns, and resources that make it very difficult for states to control. And so there's really a need to find regional solutions. And this is something I think that governments and NGOs and others are not always very good at doing. We tend to separate our programs by country without finding the mechanisms and, and having the analytic models to be able to work on some of these cross-border uh, drivers. I also wanted to mention, though, the importance of promoting country learning. While my presentation so far has uh, concentrated mainly on the negative things going on, I think you also find some positives. And I think there's a lot that different countries can learn from each other. For example, Indonesia, if you go back uh, almost 20 years, the fall of Suharto, the economic crisis, you had separatist conflicts at two ends of the country. You had five pro provinces that were experiencing large-scale intercommunal violence, each of which killed um, over 1,000 people, with one exception, Central Sulawesi. There were worries the country was going to fragment. And yet, fast forward 15 years on, things are not perfect. Conflict in Aceh has come to an end. The large-scale intercommunal um, violent conflicts, there are still violence there, but you don't see it any, anywhere at the level from before. Decentralization, peace agreements, other tactics were used in order to bring people together. And Indonesia is just one example. And I think, again, this is something that's important for government development agencies to promote, learning across countries. My final point today is the need to get better data. It was a very challenging exercise putting this book together because data sets just do not exist that accurately capture levels and forms of violence in Asia. You have cross-national civil war data sets, but they only focus on one form of violence, and also they tend to collect only incidents reported in English language press, and they're quoted by people sitting thousands of miles away from the places where conflict is occurring. You find homicide data sets using government data, UNODC and so on, but they aggregate all forms of violence into one. So you can't actually tell, you know, is this land conflict driving things? Is this gender-based violence? And they also tend not to disaggregate data subnationally as well. What we need is better data sets in order to give us a more accurate picture. The Asia Foundation has been working over the last few years uh, on supporting the development of these systems in, another, in a number of countries. Others, such as the World Bank, have been working in the past in places like Indonesia and the Philippines on this. Uh, the Asia Foundation has been helping to set up place, uh, systems in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, to try and provide deep-grained information that can be used. So while I think this volume is going to be useful for people, while I think we break ground with it, I think, I hope in 10 years' time we can come back with better data that will allow us to do an even better job. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I look forward to today's discussion. Well, thank you, Patty. Really very impressive, sweeping, um, and lots of stimulating thoughts of, of how to dig down a little bit deeper on some of these findings and learn more from you.
Uh, Sana, are you ready to go? Okay. Sana again wrote one of the contributing essays in the in the volume, and she'll tell us uh, the important. Good morning. So I'll be presenting um, one of the chapters um, from the from the volume that I wrote with Dan Slater, who's a, a professor of political science at the University of Michigan. And I'll just uh, follow up where Patty left off, saying that in the so the volume uh, has detailed information on 14 different countries from the region that have very obviously unique challenges, um, unique histories. Um, and, and reading them might um, sort of give the impression that you know, these problems are very, are very different from, from each other. But what we try to do in this one chapter is to apply the lens of um, regime types to understand what is it that um, we can learn by comparing these, the similarities and differences in these countries that can tell us something about um, how do political systems uh, regime types, democracy versus authoritarian regimes, bad democracies, good democracies, right? Where should we expect more or less violence? Which cases should we worry more about? Which cases should we be more concerned about? Um, and where should we, we look for opportunities for, um, for settling and for uh, resolving some of these conflicts that are ongoing in, in different countries? And how should we anticipate change? So when political systems in different countries undergo change, what does that tell us about um, the possibility of more or less violence in the, in the future? So <clears throat> I'll start by talking about what is it that regime types tell us about vulnerability to, to violence. And let me begin first by outlining um, a few broad perspectives on what is it that academics and policymakers have thought about where to expect more violence. Um, the first sort of uh, and these are uh, often competing perspectives. They have different predictions. So um, one of the more sort of dominant um, thoughts in, uh, in even in American foreign policy um, in the last uh, 75 years is that actually authoritarian regimes um, can help ethnically diverse countries, especially ones that are underdeveloped. That political order should precede um, attempts for democratization because countries that are too messy often um, are not very good at um, democratic processes and often fall apart. And so the prediction here is that authoritarian regimes should be overall more peaceful and stable than democracies. A completely um, opposite perspective is the one that is more popular today um, in American foreign policy and in, 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 and has been for, for a while, is that um, there is this concept of domestic democratic peace where democratic institutions provide opportunities for peaceful contestation over diverse preferences um, and, in, and, and inclusive institutions, which should reduce the probability of violence. And so we should expect democracies to be more peaceful and experience lower levels of violence. Um, somewhere in between, we have also arguments about the quality of democracy. It's not just about whether a country is an, author, is an authoritarian regime or a democracy, but actually what kind of, an, uh, of a democracy it is. And so here the argument is that um, Resolutely authoritarian regimes and very good uh, evolved democracies are less vulnerable to violence. But but countries that lie in the middle, which are kind of not really set, but which are often referred to as semi democracies, are often uh, more vulnerable to violence. Finally, we have people who have claimed that actually it's not about the type of democracy that you are; it's about timing. So once you are on your way to becoming a democracy, there's a, a period of political liberalization. There's a transition in place. That's the time when countries should expect to see most violence, right? Um, so let's let's think about what does Asia, sort of what does evidence from Asia look like? Which one of these perspectives might be supported there? So I think Patty showed you uh, this um, image from the from the book. Um, that basically takes different countries and then provides rankings on different kinds of violence, right? So we've taken this and we've overlaid um, some um, rankings on regime types as well. So on the leftmost corner, you see that on the leftmost uh, sort of column, you will see that, that we've um, noted the quality scores 
So quality four scores are commonly used by academics and also policymakers to understand the degree of democracy or authoritarianism in different cases. These are usually based on the degree of competition that is allowed in elections, uh, the way that the executive is recruited, and constraints on the power of the executive. Right, so very procedural uh, uh, forms of um, democracy or authoritarianism are assessed by these. Uh, a score of 10 uh, denotes higher level of democracy, and the lower the score goes, the lower the level of democracy and higher the level of authoritarianism. 88 means transition, so that's why Myanmar there um, is noted as such in the scores. So what we did was we, we tried to overlay these scores with the uh, different levels of violence that um, are coming out of the country reports, and we rank them. So full democracy up, and then, and then democracy goes down. And so if there was a relationship between the level of democracy or between different regime types and violence, then you would see some sort of color patterns emerge in this table, right, which we didn't. Um, we see that um, violence and different, not just in, in terms of different types, but levels of violence, are quite prevalent across different levels of democracy, which led us to make the conclusion that at least uh, based on this broad comparison, there is no straightforward relationship between regime type and violence in Asia. Um, but what about the sort of very specific claims that we've seen, right? So one of the arguments is that actually younger democracies are more vulnerable to violence than older ones. Um, and so, so we, we checked for that and we found that regions the region's oldest democracies are actually just as violent as their younger counterparts. Um, so I would ask you to, to have a look um, at the comparison between uh, India, Indonesia, and Philippines. So these countries have different history of democratic governance. India has never really seen an authoritarian government uh, with a little blip in the 1970s with the emergency rule. Um, Indonesia has uh, been democratic since 1998 and the Philippines since 1986, after the People Power Revolution. And yet, despite these different lengths of democracy uh, in these areas, you can perhaps see from the, um, from the table that they, the, not just in levels of violence, these democracies are, are similar, but are also actually experience similar types of, of conflict um, as well. Um, another, another thing that we found is that actually cases that have very similar regime dynamics Right, sort of the quality issue, um, experience vastly different kinds of, of violence. So here I would draw your attention to two cases from Asia. One is Pakistan and the other one is Thailand. Um, these two are sort of known as the revolving door cases of democracy in the region where one military regime comes in and then the democratic government goes out and then so on and so forth. Um, and so have very sort of similar dynamics in that sense. Uh, that there is democracy, but it's never stable. And yet you would see that Pakistan and Thailand look very different in their makeup um, of, of levels of violence, very simply, where Pakistan is far more violent and has experienced far higher levels of conflict uh, compared, to, compared to Thailand. What about, um, what about the, the claim that authoritarian developmentalism is, um, is a stabilizing force? And that argument has been made very forcefully in Asian cases um, sometimes um, you know, sort of often credited with producing Asian tigers and cats and all kinds of other, um, you know, uh, ferocious animals. Um, and so we actually find that that's not really the case, right? And um, we find that it's not the case be uh, because when we look at data that is before the last 15 years, so um, the data presented in the volume covers the last 15 years, but it is worth uh, having a look farther back and, um, and recalling that actually uh, some of the worst mass atrocities in the second half of the 20th century have been committed by um, authoritarian rulers and rulers in Asia. Specifically, it's worth remembering the anti-communist pogroms that took place in Indonesia in 1965 where about um, an estimated half a million people were killed and the Khmer Rouge killings in Cambodia that um, again led to the death of um, about a million people and displacement of, of numerous, numerous others. Um, there is an argument to be made that uh, authoritarian regimes are more stable as they consolidate, but we would also dispute that. I think the report lays out very clearly that there are rising and simmering tensions in places like Malaysia that have been led by a single party uh, government for a very long time, and also in Cambodia. 
Um, and so also this particular claim doesn't, we don't find evidence to support it either. There is the, the claim that um, times of transition are especially troubling for, for democracies. And we find that there, there is evidence for that. Uh, transitions to democracy in Asia have been marked with, uh, with violence, but only in cases where there, are, there were pre-existing long-standing conflicts from uh, authoritarian times. So these are some graphs that I picked up from, from the report. So you can see that, so Indonesia, Nepal, Myanmar, and Pakistan have sort of experienced transitions to democracy in the past 30 years. And you can see that um, there are peaks in the, in, the, in the trends that are presented here um, in communal violence and uh, in Pakistan's case, terrorist, terrorist violence as well. Um, and um, if you read the country reports, you would, you would see that um, actually most of these peaks correspond with times of political liberalization. Right? So in that sense, uh, the observation that transitions can make countries more vulnerable to, to violence does ring true. Uh, in the Asian cases. But I would like to point your, uh, to, to draw your attention to the fact that in most of these cases, the violence that came to the surface was connected to grievances that were formed under authoritarian rule and conflicts that were brewing under authoritarian rule. In many cases where you have civil wars, the infrastructure for rebel organizations was also built under authoritarian rule. So while the timing of conflict may uh, be more likely, we, we are more likely to see um, violence more during times of transition. It does, it certainly doesn't come out of the democratic process by itself, right? It has long roots in, in um, protracted periods of authoritarian rule um, that should be kept in mind uh, when trying to tackle. So it's not just democracy rushes in and uh, elites start to fan fears of nationalism and then mobilize and um, it, it, it has long-standing um, historical causes that, that play a very vital part. So if regime type is not a good predictor of violence in Asia, then what is, right? What might be, what, what other factors might we look at to be able to make sense of why is it that violence happens in different places in different times? Um, another factor besides regime type or besides the political system uh, is that of state capacity. And a lot of donor efforts and over time have been sort of um, spent on building state capacity, right? Building capacity of bureaucracies to do their jobs. In some cases, building the capacity of new democracies to be able to enforce um, order. Uh, by that, I mean coercive capacity, that of the you know, policing institutions and the, and the military and such. So does it? Does it help state capacity? Um, we find actually that uh, state capacity makes a big difference in authoritarian regimes. So. Authoritarian regimes with low levels of state capacity experience high levels of volume. Um, and examples from Asia would include uh, Philippines under the Marcos regime uh, and also the Myanmar military regime. So poorly, so countries that have authoritarian rule and poorly organized coercive infrastructure are engaging in what we call high levels of violence, right? High levels of high quality of uh, repression where they have to go and physically assault their, um, their uh, their foes or their enemies. Whereas authoritarian regimes with highly sophisticated um, um, capacity for surveillance and for low level repression don't actually have to have open confrontations with their, with their enemies. They can actually engage in you know, preventing a lot, of the, a lot of the demonstrations, a lot of the challenges before they even come to the force. But when we look at how state capacity affects democracies, it's not so clear. Uh, it doesn't, it, it doesn't sort of uh, lend itself to the same kind of binary uh, that it does in authoritarian regimes. So when we look at Asia, we find that we have, on the one hand, we have Pakistan and Sri Lanka that have highly evolved armies actually comparatively and, and relatively because they have been fighting internal and external foes for a long time. They have um, you know, highly sophisticated bureaucracies and, and weaponry and such. At the same time, they experience more violence than much of the smaller countries like Timor-Leste and uh, and Mongolia that have experienced relatively more um, stable transitions um, compared to the other, uh, other cases. So that leads us to, con to conclude that actually there might be different pathways for stability in different kinds of regimes. So while authoritarian regimes may be more dependent on higher levels of state capacity to maintain stability, in democracies what matters more is actually the level um, of, of the durability of political settlements, right? Whether or not political elites can sit together and agree on basic rules of the democratic competition, 
state capacity can be built later, right? So we're challenging the, the sort of very prevalent idea that state capacity has to be built uh, first and then democracy can take, can take root. Um, moving on to the second question, right? So given that we have talked a little bit about when we should expect violence, where should we expect the resolution of conflicts, given that we have a wide variation of regime types within, within the region? And um, um, we find that actually a democratic transitions, as I mentioned before, do increase the likelihood, do increase the likelihood of um, violence in, uh, uh, in times of transition, but at the same time, they also provide unique opportunities for, for negotiation and settlement. So what we find actually is that in, within the region, transition cases, cases that have gone through democratic transitions, um, have been able to successfully negotiate peace settlements with their mortal enemies as opposed to um, some of the longest standing democracies in the regions that have sought um, military victories over, over rebels. And I wanted to show you this, this image just to sort of show a contrast that um, you know, these sort of warm and fuzzy photos of people shaking hands with their old enemy are actually very young democracies, right? Who've been able to do that. So you've got Indonesia, you've got the Aceh peace settlement, you've got the Mindanao peace settlement in the Philippines, and then you've got the Nepalese uh, comprehensive peace agreement, right? And on, on the right-hand side, you can see that the sort of more militarized solutions have been implemented and sought by, um, by um, older democracies, so India, for example, and also Sri Lanka uh, sought a victory over the uh, Tamil Tiger rebels. Why is that the case? We, we think that more research is needed on, on this, but in the, in the paper we present actually three factors that might make this possible. One is we think that behavioral factors are important in transition regimes, uh, transitioning regimes. Uh, elites have more experience in talking to people who don't basically agree with any rules of the game uh, because everything is in flux, and so they're, they're more experienced, and in older democracies, people lack that, that experience in talking to people who are negotiating with people who don't have any basic agreement. Uh, structural opportunities in times of transitions, we see that uh, a lot is on the table. Basic shape of the political system is often on the table for negotiation for reforms. And that creates more opportunities for horse trading with people that you disagree with. Um, so it might make the chances of a settlement uh, more likely. Finally, um, we find that political considerations are, uh, play a big role uh, as well. So, in, um, in, in democratizing settings, you often have other reforms coming in, such as decentralization, where power is given and delegated to the regions, which might make the demands for um, more autonomy from other parts of the country more uh, less likely, so that when you are settling with one region that's asking for, uh, for autonomy, you're not worried that others will make, start making similar demands, and that makes politicians more confident about coming to the negotiating table because they don't think that they're opening a Pandora's box where it might start similar sort of demands from, from other regions um, because they've been settled through sort of a wider institutional reform. Um, and so ironically, we think actually for, for donors and for, for mediators, while access, may be, access to sort of government institutions may be easier in uh, democratic settings, it might actually be more fruitful to be in, involved in mediation attempts in crisis settings because that's where most successful negotiations might be actually taking place. And Myanmar is a case in point um, relevant for today. Finally, I want to talk about how is it that we anticipate uh, change uh, in political system and how that actually uh, leads to a decline in sort of um, large scale forms of violence and then uh, communal, uh, sorry. So what we find is that Democratic consolidation is often expected to correspond with um, decreasing levels of violence overall. As democracy, the quality of democracy increases over time, we expect that people will fight less because they will settle most of their conflicts um, within, the, within the institutional arena through elections and through other sort of institutionalized channels. What we find is that that's, uh, that's uh, somewhat true. So consolidation of dem democratic institutions typically does lead to a decline in large scale forms of violence, such as riots and communal war. And I just want to show you this graph quickly to make sure that, that we can see that visually. So in Nepal, we've seen a decline in, um, in deaths, in Pakistan as well, and in Indonesia as well, has, um, the transition period has been followed with 
um, a decline in large-scale violence. But um, this decline in large-scale violence is typically accompanied by a rise in a more everyday form of violence, which is um, vigilantism. So I'm sure that all of you have heard about cow vigilantes in India uh, that typically go punishing people who are accused of eating beef. So there are mobs of citizens, often organized, sometimes loose, um, accusing people of eating beef, which is um, um, uh, offensive to sensibilities of, of people who practice Hinduism, and then accusing them of having done something wrong and then punishing them instantaneously, often in the form of a lynching. Right? There are also other kinds of, of vigilantism in, um, in effect. So, for example, there are in India what are known as anti-Romeo squads, Yes, they are um, often looking for young couples who are hanging out and romancing in the parks and then cons considering them to be immoral and then punishing them often with a beating and, um, and spontaneous citizen's arrest, um, things of that nature. In Bangladesh, uh, mobs have attacked um, people who have been accused of believing in atheism. In Pakistan as well, um, there was a re very high profile uh, recent lynching of a college student who was accused of questioning uh, some of the tenets of, um, of the Islamic faith. Um, in Indonesia, uh, there has also been an, an increase, and, and we have numbers from Indonesia, so I just want to quickly show you that. Um, so the black graph here shows a decline in the number of incidents uh, such as riots and communal violence over time, so 1998 to 2014. And the lighter graph is showing you an increase in incidents of vigilante violence. And the, this vigilante violence is, again, directed towards the same sort of minorities, right? So same uh, sort of poor neighborhoods, et cetera, um, also, um, what you may call it, um, churches, so mob attacks on churches, which used to take the shape of riots before, so in the, in the black zone, but have sort of since shifted form. So um, it's worth noting that vigilantism is often connected to the same sort of cleavages that uh, were prevalent in society before, but, um, but evolve over time to take the form of sort of more individual targeting and punishing of, of people. Um, why is this happening? Um, we think that there are two things. First, that, that as democracies consolidate, they often um, lead to better rights for people who are um, of a minority confessions, and that sort of creates a public backlash against their, their expanded rights. Increased public accountability of government officials also increases the, right, the, the risk of engaging in a riot. Right? So that sort of puts pressure on not to engage in a riot, but at the same time increases uh, the public backlash against uh, minority rights. Electoral competition, ironically, increases incentives for people to use vigilantism as a form of violent lobbying to create the perception that this is what the public wants and then for the politicians to sort of take up policies that would then um, do exactly what the vigilantes are asking to do. So for example, in India, beef eating has been banned by local governments because of these um, sort of fear of these vigilante attacks. Um, and finally, I would say that effective violence monitoring, monitoring tools are necessary, as mentioned earlier by Patty, to detect some of these shifts and, and, and that might otherwise go unnoticed, right? So we don't have very detailed data from India on how vigilante, how widespread it is, uh, or even from Bangladesh, we just know that it's increasing. Um, finally, conclusions. Um, some of the sort of key conclusions are that violence is, um, is very widespread in, in Asia, but it's also uneven. Um, the patterns don't conform to any sort of specific regime type expectations, um, and that uh, pathways for peace might be different um, in different types of regimes. Finally, um, transition cases present high risk and high reward opportunities. So. Um, for, for mediation, and, um, and finally, improvements in democratic competition lead to a shift in violence, um, which may be detected by and responded to well by um, effective monitoring tools. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sana. <laughs> so I really appreciated that you came to some kind of uh, counterintuitive conclusions about that we have to be questioning our conventional wisdom about where is violence most likely and how do we sort of understand some of the texture and nuances of it. Um, I have a question about gender-based violence, but you've all been very patient, so I'm going to turn to the audience first for any questions. There are mics coming around. If you would um, uh, identify yourself and uh, if you prefer, if you want to address your question to one of our speakers or both, just let us know. 
Nobody raises their, ah, there we go. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Rose Jensen. I'm also at George Mason, but at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. And I'm, I haven't been able to read the full report yet, but I'm curious about the indicators for the local conflicts over resources and community rights, because those conflicts aren't really new, but including them in data sets like this is fairly new, so thank you for doing that. But, you know, we know what um, national civil war, transnational terrorism looks like, but resource conflicts are a bit different, and I'm curious how you develop those indicators. As I said, we worked with what we had. <laughs> you know, there, there are, as you point out, no data sets that systematically record this. So what we, we did, and I, this is true of many of the forms of violence that, that we cover, is we essentially just looked for what was out there. Um, most of the land and natural resource data is produced by NGOs and advocacy organizations, some of which have more methodological sophistication and some of which don't. So again, especially when we're ranking countries on this, we were fairly tentative because it's just not solid enough, not solid enough data. Um, some national human rights organizations, sometimes uh, linked to government, sometimes not, often collect data on this, but I would suspect it's very um, partial and not, not complete. So again, we, we work with what we can, um, but we had to make judgments on whether we felt the data was accurate enough. This is one of the advantages of working with our country offices. We have 18 country offices, so we could actually run you know, material by them to see, is this plausible? Does this make sense? Is there a political agenda here? Um, and on a number of cases, we decided not to cite data that was produced where we felt that um, we weren't sure enough about the rigor. So let me raise my gender violence question, and a little bit picks up on Sana's point that while transitions are both times of high risk but also high opportunity, I wonder, and this may, again, like the natural resource question, may be more uh, intuitive judgment that's partly based on hard data but not exclusively based on, on numbers. Uh, so I think the more we learn about gender, we know that there's sort of a, a base of violence in the home that is probably underreported in many traditional societies and many modernizing societies. But I'm wondering whether when there's a liberalization, an opening up of uh, women's access to work, women's access to school, whether there's a corresponding, tempor hopefully temporary, increase in violence because the the, the local norms are being challenged. Um, and so I wonder whether we, we know of the difference between violence against women in the, pri in the family setting versus in the public space. And whether, even if it increases, do we have any cases where it kind of temporarily increases and then goes down as people get adjusted mm. to women in the public space? I, and so it's just my values-driven, uh, assertion of is that the pattern or do we do we have anything to say about whether you know opening up public space to women actually also puts them at risk good question yeah. one of the things that's very hard when interpreting gender-based violence data is to know to what extent when you see changes it's a change in actual incidents or to what extent it's a function of increased ability to report right. So in quite a few countries that are starting to move in the right direction with this, Philippines in particular, but also Indonesia somewhat as well, you see rises in levels of gender-based violence. And it's very difficult to, to interpret that. You know, is it, it that women are more comfortable to report? Is it that people are more comfortable, that you've got stronger civil society right. organizations that are aiding women or collecting data? Right. Um, or is it an increase? And it's so difficult to work out. Yeah. Um, in places, I think you, though your point as well about whether you see rises in violence whenever women feel more empowered to play a more active political role. So I don't know of cases where you see it go up and then go down. Um, but I think 
India is an interesting case here, where I think, in particular following the, um, the high profile rape on the, in the bus in, in Delhi, you have seen um, large scale movement in support of women's rights in terms of protecting yourself from violence. And that coincides with what I think is not only increased reporting, but actually increased use of violence force by men against women in order to try and keep them in their place in the yep. public sphere. Um, where that so will go, where, where that will go, um, I don't know. I think it's in India it's the same with caste violence as well, actually. Mm -hmm. As you start to see more lower caste people, Dalits, play a more active role in, in, in the public sphere, that you see more violence against them. Because violence is a strategy, it's a political strategy, an economic strategy to protect power. Um, and so I think that there may be historical cases, although I think this, you know, the rise of of, of women's rights is a fairly new phenomenon in most countries, maybe with the exception of Philippines. So I think this would be interesting, and, and maybe another study so could really actually look at this, yeah. right, to yeah. see are there historical cases that can see whether it goes back down or not. And Afghanistan is one where we know that there is pushback against, yeah. you know, and, and that certainly the donor community and the aid community have, have promoted, um, you know, greater access for women in the public space, and and how are we understanding that transition? Is the transition a largely, is it sort of slowly moving in the right direction, or is it also causing some short-term yeah. uh, disruption? May I just yes, add to please. that? So, um, in terms of where reporting is higher, right? So, sure, we can't say anything about. We, it's hard to to differentiate how much of the increase in violence is coming from reporting and how much of it is actually increases in the incidence of violence against women, especially in the household. But we can guess where the reporting is higher, right? So we can guess that, for example, in urban areas where police stations are closer mm -hmm. and have special women facilities for coming in and reporting, and many, in many Asian countries, they have done that where they have sort of a, a woman in charge of a police station section where they would come in and, and then people can come in and, and report and, and ask for counseling even. Um, reporting would be higher there. So mm -hmm. adjustments can be made based on that. Um, the other, so in Indonesia, so micro sense, we find that most of the gender-based violence is reported in suburban and urban areas, um, and is very low in parts of the country where uh, rape laws are are very loose. So, mm -hmm. if you come in to report, for example, in Aceh, which is a place where you have uh, special uh, religious laws, if you come in to report a rape, you could be you you could be nabbed for adultery, yeah, right? So. So those are expected sort of differences between regions that we can take into account. Take into account, but at the same time, increasing women's access to the workplace may lead to a higher exposure, where women are sort of more subjected to harassment and sexual violence outside their houses. But then those numbers are often used by local politicians to restrict again women's access to right. the workforce. Right. So you have laws in suburban parts of Indonesia where women are then not allowed to stay outside the house after ten o'clock, mm -hmm. based on this sort of. Um, data that are based on the idea that, well, it's not safe for women anymore. So it goes back and forth right. in that sense. Yeah, that's a good example. Please. Yeah. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court TV producer. Uh, I got here late, so this may have already been covered, and if so, I apologize. But why did you not take external factors into consideration? Uh, for instance, I assume the American occupation of Afghanistan has had an effect on the level of violence not only in Afghanistan, but in neighboring Pakistan as well. Patty, I think that's a methodological question for you. Um, so we did. Yeah. I mean, in, in the country analyses, we try and tease out the interplay between local, domestic, cross-country, international factors as well, and have some analysis. I didn't focus on that and the, the patterns and implications, uh, in large part because in most countries, you know, the American intervention is not relevant. I mean, it's not the important thing going on. Now, obviously, Afghanistan is an exception, maybe Pakistan as well in some ways, but most of what we're looking at in Asia is conflicts that come out of domestic processes where internationals are not the key factor shaping them in, in different ways. Um, but there, you know, there, there is analysis in the country chapters of, of that. Thank you. Can you wait for the mic? Can you wait for the last piece? Min Kim, American University. Uh, not that the, these countries are not 
directly intervene by international forces, but then they might be allied with some international actors that may endorse some of the state perpetrated violence against certain groups internally, such as a lot of countries in there that when they carry out counterinsurgency against subnational armed groups, it was often then not endorsed by some neighboring countries or US, especially during the Cold War and after Cold War. Um, so I wonder if this somehow factored in, um, especially in some cases in Pakistan um, and whatnot. Um, my second question is, um, it was very interesting that the way that you guys present in terms of patterns of violence kind of shifting and evolving over time in Asia. But look, looking historically, this conflict has been concentrated geographically in the sense that there are peripheral areas of the state space usually um, that was very geographically fixed. But now, now that we see the rising violence in urban areas and vision in those areas, do you see those violence, geography of violence has been shifted towards more like visible spaces like urban areas? Or do you see that concurrently happening at the same time with the peripheral conflicts as well as urban conflicts at the same time? Or is there any shift or is it concurrently happening at the same time? Okay, second question first. Um, I think it depends what you mean by shift. I mean, maybe if you look at the share of fatalities, there would be a shift somewhat, but that's not because the fatalities are going down in peripheral areas, it's because they're going up in other areas. So I think you have these things coexisting. You have these subnational conflict regions. We, I should have mentioned as well, we're launching another report next week on um, subnational conflict in, in Myanmar. Um, and Myanmar is just one example of many countries in the region that have had large-scale violence at its periphery. So though in Myanmar actually covers about one-third of the country, so it depends how you define the periphery. But you see rising violence in many Asian cities as well. So I don't think one is displacing the other. I think the two are, the two are occurring at the same time. On the, I mean, good point, right? I mean, the internationals endorsing counterinsurgency and how that plays out. I mean, it's not something we we give a whole lot of attention to um, in, 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 the country, um, in the, the country chapters. And in some places, you know, there's, there's mention of that. Um, but, you know, by and large, we've been looking at how local politics have played out without always looking at how that is partly a product of international relations. Well, and it a little bit relates to this question of is building up state capacity always a positive thing if you've also increase the training of, of counterterrorism or counterinsurgency um, as a thinking that this is a way to protect the civilian population in general, are you also, at least in part, contributing to more violence by the state? Again, you know, I think there are probably cases where people would debate that. If I may get a yeah. word in. Yes. Um, and I think that the, the shift in geography also has to do with the shift in what is it that people are fighting, right? So the older conflicts are people fighting against the state, and now you see more and more fighting over the state, right? And so, so in some places we see that sort of peripheral conflicts have shifted to urban centers because that's where the government centers are, right? So demonstrations, violent demonstrations, those kinds of forms are shifting in to you know, areas where people get noticed, where the media is present, um, because the contest has changed. Um, and technology helps. So recently, like about in December, there was a big demonstration in Indonesia about this governor who was accused of blasphemy, and hundreds and thousands of people were transported from all over the country for that. So very big. So in Jakarta, but people coming in from all over, all over the country, and technology transport makes that possible. Could you just clarify what you meant by um, fighting against the state versus fighting over the state? What, what's the distinction? So, so the, distinction, the distinction would be, for example, separatist conflicts, right? Uh, so, uh -huh. so fighting against the state in the sense that fighting with state forces to, to separate from a state apparatus, okay. but fighting over the state, well, now that these conflicts have settled in many parts of the, of the, um, of the region, um, you see that more and more people are fighting over distribution of resources by the government, mm -hmm. by trying to capture government, by mm -hmm. trying to get into government, as opposed to trying to get away and forming their own government. Um, and so sites are determined by what is it that people are fighting. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think that depends on the country. That's certainly the Indonesia story, but it's not the southern Thailand story, or the Myanmar story, or the Mindanao story yet. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think, that earlier you, stage you know, you, conflict, you right. see this pattern in, in, in some countries, but there are other countries where these subnational conflicts against the state are, are rumbling on. I just do want to draw attention that you've both uh, mentioned that Sri Lanka and Nepal are in a kind of post-conflict. I mean, so one thing that your story does in terms of finding good news or, you know, patterns, that it is interesting to look at the countries that as recently as three or four years ago we thought were still in a, in a sort of post-Civil War turbulent period. Um, I, I think your data suggests that in both those cases things are calming down. That. Things are way better than before, uh -huh. but there are factors in both countries that are problematic. In, I mean, in Sri Lanka, um, the situation in the north and the east of the country is still not great. There's not a lot of violence, but you still have essentially military occupation of a, a lot of land up there. But even more worrying, you've seen a rise in intercommunal violence against uh, religious minorities and uh, um, against religious minorities, anti-Hindu violence. Uh, and anti-Muslim violence as well. Now, this is nothing like at the level of whenever the war with the LTTE was going on or JV, against JVP, the, the communist movement in, in the 70s. But, you know, the, the, the lesson is yeah. don't be complacent. You know, I'm sure most of you know the you know, Paul Collier and others about the civil war recurrence. And so it may not even be that civil war recurs, but that other forms of violence often rise in the wake of a successful peace settlement. In Nepal, things are, are pretty calm as well, ish. I mean, you, you have had, there's been um, on rising, um, sorry, ongoing violence in the Terai, in the region that stretches across the southern belt with the border of India. Um, a number of years ago, there was a, a Madeshi Andalan, or a, a large kind of movement. And there are still armed groups there, there are still groups that um, I guess the Nepali government is trying to work out whether they're actually a threat for independence or whether this is more localized. So the situation is better, but don't count your chickens. Um, just I should ask you methodologically, over the 15 years, if, if in terms of putting countries in categories, um, how, what was the sort of cutoff date by which you determine countries change? Right. It, over that 15-year period. So um, were there any uh, sort of analytical challenges of trying to decide um, how to categorize countries the, along that authoritarian to democratic you know, spectrum? Yeah, so one of the things that we did was to point out that even though the data is for the last 15 years, and we noted the most, sort of most more recent regime types, we did point out, for example, that even though Pakistan is a democracy, um, it has gone through multiple rapid transitions and in the way that Thailand has as well, right? So let's not just treat it as a case of democracy because it is a democracy today, but let us also consider um, how it got to the point where it did, which mm -hmm. is more comparable to, to Thailand than it is, for example, to Indonesia, mm -hmm. even though both Pakistan and Indonesia are democracies. Um, and also by pointing out sort of the you know, 30, 40, 50 year history um, in terms of the mass genocide, yeah. um, right? So, so let's not just think that these democracy, that the, when they were authoritarian regimes, they were sort of more stable in this 15 year violence as is happening now. Worst violence was committed um, at the beginning of authoritarian periods in, in some countries mm -hmm. than they've experienced today. So we try to put that in perspective in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Hi, Bernie Baskin. Um, at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned that there's a um, a rise in violence in places like Ulaanbaatar, uh, given the extreme rate of uh, rural populations moving to the city centers. I'm curious um, if there's any data on the reason for the relocation, whether it's climate change or just access to opportunities, and if, the, if there's any data around the reason for the violence having to do with the lack of infrastructure in the cities. You seem to allude that uh, it was uh, city planning is chaotic, and whether infrastructure in those cities, if those issues were addressed, if that might have an effect on the rate of violence. Thanks. Okay, I'm no Mongolia expert, as I'm sure most people in the room are not either. Um, but what I do know is that, um, I mean, essentially, this sped up following the withdrawal of Soviet support, where previously the rural economy received a whole bunch of subsidies, and the, the way in which the state was structured. Mm -hmm. 
was such that it made economic sense to be out there. And that, that I think there are some climate factors related to crop failure and, uh, and other things as well, which have, have led people to move, in, move into the city. Um, I, I can't say much more about that. I'm, I'm sure some people have done that analysis. Um, I haven't seen any kind of systematic explanation of why exactly um, urbanization within uh, Mongolia has led to violence and whether it's lack of infrastructure or so on. I, I mean, we, there's not a whole lot of literature out there on, on Ulaanbaatar, at least, that we could find. So. I think that's probably true, yeah. Um, but I, I haven't, you know, we haven't done a systematic study of this. Okay, last call for any final questions, and then we're going to finish up. Uh, the, the, the woman in the uh, green blouse, and then I'll, why don't we take these two questions back to back? Hi, uh, Nicole from the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, you mentioned violence against women as factors, um, you know, the public and private spaces and reporting and, then, and things like that, but did you take a look at the role of women in transition or peace building and how that would stem violence down the road? Um, obviously, they might not have a place at this point, being political or military, but um, kind of what down the road might uh, women have a place or? And sir, do you want to ask your question? Uh, hello, Derek Lighton with uh, International Republican Institutes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was curious, in looking at the types of conflicts and all the research that you've done, um, did any data point lend itself to the to surmise a rise in extremist recruitment? Or did the types of violence or the case studies in each country sort of lay a stronger foundational correlation for um, increase of external actors to mm. prey on, whether it be like Rohingya in, in mm. Bangladesh or, or Mawari uh, as a place to you know, recruit um, additional fighters both within Asia or externally? Interesting. All right, so I'm going to let both of you make any final gonna... comments on either of those questions. Well, so uh, the paper that I wrote with Dan doesn't specifically talk about extremist recruitment, but we do try to draw conclusions on where in Asia should we expect to see more, um, more bases, right? More bases for operation, which includes recruitment, but also just bases out of which terrorist organizations can operate. And we found that it's not so surprising, given the history and the trajectory of state building in Asia, that you would find bases in the Philippines, but not in Indonesia. And, and you know, sort of the evolution of course of capacity um, of authoritarian regimes as sort of the legacy has been left over where Indonesia has a more highly evolved and more engaged uh, surveillance system um, that, that prevents, um, I think, effectively in terms of the you know sort of bases being built, long term bases being built, um, but in the Philippines that is less the, that is less the case. So that's the extent to which we explored this in our paper. On the question on women as peace builders, it's not something we really focused on. I mean, we we have other work going on at the Asia Foundation on women, peace, and security that, that's focusing on this. Uh, the, the focus was largely on the problems that are playing out rather than the solutions. And I, I mean, I would agree the cross-country evidence shows that where women play a larger role, there are greater prospects for successful resolution um, there, the Philippines being, being the case that's usually cited. Uh, on extremist re recruitment, um, we didn't do a systematic study of this. I mean, each, each of the chapters does have a section on transnational terrorism where we do cite data on number of people recruited and opinion polls with attitudes and so on. And two of the country chapters, Sana's and Dan's chapter, touches a bit on this, but uh, Tony Davis's chapter on cross-border uh, factors that fuel insurgency um, do talk a lot about some of the factors that give rise to, to this as well. So. I think some of the questions have really given us, you know, a sense of that, you know, it, it, as rich and complex as this study is, there's always the, the next analytic question that's sort of adjacent to it, and you, um, but, uh, and those are, other people are also working, the peace building question, and I assumed from your recruitment question, you also meant how do non-state, bad non-state actors exploit the grievances that are already in groups that are prone to violence? How do they channel those grievances into some, you know, 
larger cause, uh, et cetera. Not ju and there's the state capacity, but there's also the playing on the, uh, the emotions and the political affiliations of people. And looking yeah. historically as well. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's much more of a contemporary issue suddenly, but looking historically, it's yeah. going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for uh, your participation, and very great congratulations and thanks to both Sana and Patty for a really uh, fascinating study. Um, hope you'll be looking on the Asia Foundation website for this and other studies that you'll find useful. So thank you all for coming. The, the address for downloading the report is up there. If you do want to tweet about this event or the report, it's hashtag State of Conflict.